Welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's episode 184. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as always, I'm joined by the man with a plan, Mr. Mark Pearson Freeland. Good morning, Mark. Hey, good morning, Mike. I mean, we are well on our way through our series on productivity, aren't we? We are ripping through it. And just when you thought it would all be about the ones and zeros, it'd be all about executing time management with precision. I think we may have discovered it is so much more than that. And today's show is another twist on that story. Today's show, listeners and members, is Ken Blanchard's The One Minute Manager. And just as a reminder, Mike, Ken Blanchard's book is now coming in to our series after Brian Allen's Getting Things Done. We had Chris Bailey's Hyper Focus. We had Atul Gawande's The Checklist Manifesto. I feel as though each episode has now uh, slowly added up. I feel as though I'm learning lessons and even reveals surprising insights from each of these books, each of these authors, each of these productivity hacks and tips each week. And it just keeps getting better and better. And the One Minute Manager is just another step in the armament of becoming a very good productive person, aren't we? Yeah, totally. And I think that, um, you know, one minute manager is right up there with, you know, the likes of maybe someone like uh, Peter Drucker, uh, who's a very famous um, executive coach, author, and uh, just general superstar. This one minute manager is a classic. It's the intersection between teamwork and productivity. So it you know, it really touches not only on to some of the themes about attention and focus, but what I think is really interesting about Ken Blanchard and his work in the One Minute Manager, Mark, is he equally examines you, the individual, and your relationship with the people that you work with, not necessarily manage per se in the traditional sense, but people that you work with, collaborate with. Mm. And uh, we know that if you really are trying to do something special, something brave or dangerous, build a community, a product, maybe build a business, regardless of what you're trying to do, you can't do it on your own. Being the best version of yourself is actually somewhat ironically mm team sport, isn't it, Mark? Yeah. This great quote from Ken Blanchard, uh, which I just want to read out, is a great demonstration of that, Mike. So Ken says, the best minute I spend is the one I invest in people. What a great demonstration as we think about productivity. It's something that I think already through the series, it feels quite a lot around how I'm going to improve myself. Now, as we pivot towards Ken Blanchard, And exactly as you were just saying, collaboration, understanding uh, those around us, we can become that little bit more productive because we are looking towards investing in other people. And I feel as though that's the real big takeaway that we're going to have from the One Minute Manager, which like you say, is all around how we now shift our thinking a little bit into being productive with others. Yeah. So what an action-packed show we've got. We're going to look at specifically a framework on how you can really get aligned, share goals, objectives, um, and look at how you're tracking with your teammates, um, you know, praising the good stuff, redirecting the stuff that needs improvement. All of this is about building the habits of being a manager and boy, Mark, the world needs it because my experience has been most managers suck. So (laughs) we have a duty of care here, Mark. We need to unleash the goodness, the servant leadership, the helping of others, putting others before yourself. I think this is productivity and so much more as we studied the One Minute Manager by Ken Blanchard. I'm fired up. I'm ready to go, Mark. Tell me, where do we want to start? Well, look, I think the countdown is on and we've got one minute to go until we can hear that <laughs> first clip. So, Mike, look, we've, we've built it up. I think we've made the case of why the productivity series deserves the One Minute Manager. So now let's hear from the author, Ken Blanchard, discussing how being a better manager often starts with the individual serving first and leading second. I really feel that the world is in desperate need of a different leadership role model. We've seen what self-serving leaders have done 
to the detriment of people in every sector of society all around the world. And so what we really need is people who are servant leaders, uh, people who are there to serve first and lead second. <laughs> Leadership is an influence process. We're all influencing each other all the time. So everybody's a leader in every part of their lives. Wow, that's really the most effective leaders I know are just good human beings. They care about people. They listen more than they talk. They want to help people win. That's about caring, and it's about your heart. There's three key aspects of, of being a leader, being a manager. One is clear goals. All good performance starts with clear goals. And so people around you, if you want to make a difference in their lives, they need to know what they're trying to accomplish. Second, once the goals are clear, you ought to wander around and see if you can catch them doing something right and give them a one-minute praising, acknowledging what they've done, tell them how you feel about what they've done, how it's impacted you, and, and that's really important. And then if their performance isn't going exactly the way you both wanted, you give them what we call now a one-minute uh, redirect. We sort of say, gee, I'm observing uh, your performance here, and I don't think it's as good as we thought it would be. Do you agree? And they usually will because you're not there to punish them. And then you say, what can I do to help you get back on track? One of the important things about being an effective leader is to enter your day slowly with some sense of intent and think about what's, what's on my schedule today. How do I want to be seen today? And then at the end of the day, put praisings in your journal. What did you do today that you feel really good about? And then redirections. What, would, what did you do that you'd love to replay? And that'll maybe set a goal for you the next day. I think a good manager is more intentional in their behavior, not caught in the rat race. And the problem with the rat race is even if you win it, you're still a rat. I like to look at it, the difference between success and significance. I think when people are focusing on success, they're thinking about how much money they make, the recognition they get for their efforts and their power and status. When that's who you think you are, the only way you can maintain your feelings of self-worth is to get more of those. And I think then you miss significance, which to me, the opposite of making money is generosity of your time, your talent, your treasure, and a fourth one, touch, reaching out to people. What's the opposite of recognition? It's service. And what's the opposite of power and status? It's loving relationships. Because when all is said and done in life, when you're gone and you die, the only thing you get to take with you is your soul. And that's where you store who you love and who loved you. Whoa, he just kind of went Dalai Lama <laughs> on us right there at the end. I mean, oh my gosh, Mike, what we just kind of saw was two minutes of Ken Blanchard building out from that moment where you're sitting with somebody, providing some sort of feedback, discussing the goals that they have, and how that really reveals a new type of intentional leadership of self-awareness where you're putting them before yourself. <laughs> And then he took us, I mean, he made the case and he's like, so in the end, what's your legacy going to be? Power and status or loving relationships? Because in the end, that's what you're going to remember. Mm -hmm. That's going to be your legacy. Um, what, uh, I mean, this, this whole series, Mark, keeps doing this. You know, Dave Allen talked about energy and attention, not so much just getting things done and having a task list. Mm. And it, we've just continued to build from there. Isn't it just mind bending to see how much productivity can come right back to some of your core values on who you want to be? Good stuff, yeah. huh? Yeah, I totally, totally agree. It, it's surprising when you think about uh, digging into a book. I mean, it's titled The One Minute Manager. Talk about being productive. It's all about getting it done in 60 seconds. What Ken's already making the case for here is it is not something that uh, should be deemed as disposable as that. Obviously, the tips we're going to find out later in the show are very practical, but where he's coming from is much more intentional. There's generosity with time. There's setting those goals, praises, and redirections that we'll talk about in the show. But really what he's calling out here is everything you do is to help others succeed. You want to be, as he calls out, a good human being. 
I mean, these are big life lessons, Mike, that probably <laughs> transcend beyond productivity, but these are essential, like you say, life skills and tools that we should all do in order to be that best version of ourselves. Yeah. Fantastic stuff. And this is all coming out of the One Minute Manager by, by Ken Blanchard and a great build on some of the thinking we've had about focus and checklists and, you know, really getting your energy set up for the day. And I'll tell you, Mark, what can get you very set up for the day? What can really, really unlock your servant leadership is being a member of the Moonshots podcast. What do you think? I mean, this membership, Mike, is something that you know, we're so enthusiastic about. And what's fantastic to see is how much enthusiasm is coming through from you, our listeners and our members every single week. Because as you're probably hearing each time, my uh, list is getting that little <laughs> bit longer every week. And what's amazing though, Mike, and for all of our Moonshots family, is just to receive that level of support for the show from you, our listeners. So please, a warm round of applause, welcome, and much more than one minute of celebration to Bob, Niles, John and Terry, Neil, Marjolin, Ken and Dietmar, Tom, Marjan, Connor, Rodrigo, Yasmin, Lisa, Sid and Mr. Bonjour, Maria and Paul, Berg and Kalman, David, Joe, Crystal and Evo, Christian, Hurricane Brain, Samuela, Kelly, Barbara, Bob, Andre, Matthew, Eric, Abby, Josie, Joshua. <laughs> I'm starting to lose my breath, as well as our <laughs> brand new members, Chris, Kobe, and Damien. Thank you for joining us over the last week. I mean, Mike, this list is pretty substantial. I've, I feel a little bit lightheaded. <laughs> so you should with, uh, with that little uh, repertoire. <laughs> but we are really very grateful uh, to each and every one of you for your membership, for your patronage, because that helps us, you know, pay the bills uh, to keep spreading the word of the Moonshots podcast. And we are, as I said, not only grateful, but it really gives us a lot of encouragement um, to know that we are providing something of value and uh, it helps your contribution. It's just one cup of coffee a month. That's it. Um, your contribution helps us pay all the bills that we get for doing this uh, show. And Mark, it's like, I mean, you just don't realize how many different subscriptions that you need to different services to do something like this. So um, thanks to each and every one of those, those members. And Mark, we got a little excited, didn't we? And we, we set a goal. Do you remember what would happen if we got to 50 members? We said when we reach 50 members, we would be able to offer all of our listeners and our members the chance to pick up Moonshots merchandise, Mike. And I mean, we're very, very close, aren't we? Yes. Well, the, the Moonshots team has been on the secret bat channel, has been sharing some designs behind the scenes. And I think we want to publish uh, these for your feedback. So here we go. When you're listening to this, go and check out moonshots.io or go to any of our social, or if you're a member, go to our Patreon page and you'll see the really, really fantastic uh, merch designs and tell us which ones do you like. And uh, based on what we get uh, from all of you uh, in terms of feedback, what your suggestions are, we will get the merch up and going so you can be sporting a Moonshots T-shirt. It could be a shoot for the moon. Maybe there will be some posters as well. Could be perfect for a gift uh, to have in what is probably the highly used home office right now. So I'm thinking we got a ton of opportunities, but we need your feedback. So we're going to push out um, the, uh, the merchandise designs. And once we get all of your feedback, uh, then uh, we'll get them available to you. So you can just order those and get your Moonshots tea, your Moonshots poster at home. It will be um, so awesome to spread the Moonshots word. And it's all thanks to you, our members. Uh, we said if we got to 50 members, we'd launch the merch. We're getting really close now. So head over to moonshots.io 
check out the blog and you'll be able to see the designs there or head to any of our social. We'll have it all published. And once again, thanks again to our members for helping us get across the line to get the merch out the door and to spread the word so everybody can learn out loud. And as we think about learning out loud, Mark, where is our next step in the One Minute Manager journey? Well, as Ken was revealing and teasing in that first intro clip, Mike, there are three big pieces to learn from the One Minute Manager. So we've got some great clips from Productivity Game, one of our absolute favorites on YouTube, who has a really nice uh, approach and a good job at breaking down those three buckets. So let's hear from Productivity Game now. Introduce us and help us break down that first piece within Ken Blanchard's The One Minute Manager, which is all about one minute goals. If you don't give your people a clear goal to aim at, you're essentially blindfolding them and telling them to shoot an arrow at a target they can't see. A good manager takes the blindfold off and points at a target, but a great manager takes the blindfold off and lets his or her people pick the target and then adjust their distance from the target, so it feels like a challenging and fun game. In other words, great managers don't tell their people what their goal should be. They help their people set their own goals with the one-minute goal-setting process. Here's what a weekly one-minute goal-setting session might look like. Now note that this will take longer than a minute to complete initially, but once your people get familiar with the process, they will do the work up front, so future goal-setting sessions will take just one minute of your time. Start by asking, what are you hoping to complete this week? Don't be afraid to stretch yourself. As they think of the different things they could do this week, ask, of those goals, what one could have the largest impact? Remind them of the 80-20 rule. If you have five goals, what one goal, if completed, would help the team more than all the other goals combined? As they think out loud and choose their most important goal, ask, can you clarify what exactly you plan to accomplish? Get them to explain the goal in as much detail as possible, and then say, Now that you've clarified your most important goal, type out your goal with the steps you plan to take to accomplish your goal. Keep it to less than a page. Then after you've written out your goal, email it to me so I can review it and approve it. By getting your direct reports to write out their goals and share them with you, you force them to clarify their goals and ensure that you and your direct reports are on the same page. And you avoid the situation where you thought they understood what they needed to do, but were mistaken when you get back work that looks nothing like you expected. After a direct report sends you his or her plan, tell them, now print out your goal and keep it in front of you. Then at the end of each day, take a minute to ask yourself, did my actions today get me closer to completing my goal? At this point, your direct report has created a game that will keep him or her engaged and focused. They have a clear target, a time limit, hit the goal by the end of the week, and regular feedback. The one minute goal You know, the thing that I think was most important about what we were discovering that's inside of Ken Blanchard's One Minute Manager is it all starts with setting the goal. But I think Mm. there was an interesting uh, activity that we heard there, which is choosing the one that really matters. What's the one that's going to get 80% of the results? What is the actual single biggest goal? And the reason I think that this is so important, Mark, is I think most of us, fall victim to having too many goals that are not prioritized correctly. So we're like, Mm. oh my gosh, my list is so big. And so I think that could be one of the most helpful things any of us could do with a peer, a colleague, a direct report is to say, hey, Mark, I know you've got lots of goals, but what is the one goal that really matters? What's the one thing you really want to get done today? And how can I help you be accountable to that? So those other goals don't creep in and distract you. Don't you think? Yeah, it, it's very similar. It, it, I think the foundation that we were learning from Atul Gwandi's uh, work in checklists, the checklist manifesto mm-hmm. is helping you almost trim down and, and even going back to Chris Bailey with hyperfocus, start focusing on what you're trying to achieve. And I think you're, you're totally right. And I think where Ken's coming from is less is more. 
rather than having lots and lots of distractions, lots of things pulling you one way to the other, lots of uh, deadlines that are mm. either fundamentally false or it's not as important, it's not a priority like your other work. Um, I'm thinking of, you know, the Eisenhower matrix of, of looking at things that are urgent versus less important and so on. Um, but also I think what you're really finding from, from Ken in that clip is the community, the value of communication. Hmm. So you're sitting there with your manager in this case, and you're determining together what you should be focusing on. And that communication piece is what I think is, is so important because everybody's getting on the same page, the same hymn sheet. Mm. And if you agree uh, at this point, and we'll figure out, you know, addressing feedback and so on later in the show today, but just getting on that same page right at the very beginning and knowing how you'll be uh, reviewing or judging the work, I think is so important because then you feel confident just to get started, right? Yeah. And and I think there's a couple of things that happen when two people know uh, the goal right? Let's just say, for example, you are aware of what my big goal for the day is, Mark, or the big project that I'm working on that's my big priority. I mean, the first thing is, you know that uh, my goal is, uh, let's say I'm going to design the Moonshots merch, okay? It's my number one goal. Well, you can make uh, a, you can make such a big difference in holding me accountable because I can say, Oh, hey, Mark, I was working on the Moonshots app. And you can say, hang on a sec. Mm. I thought your big goal was actually to do the merchandise. I'd be like, oh, yeah, but it was so cool. I got to play with this tech and I was getting this new feature going. It was really exciting. But, but Mike, Mike, mm-hmm. you said the merchandise was your new one. And you're like, oh, yeah, you're right. But it was really cool. No, Mike, you need to go and focus on the merch. And I'm like, okay, all right. I'm going to put down the app and I'll go back to the merch. This this sort of um, idea of sharing your goals helps you get clearer in what matters. And sometimes we need to have others hold us accountable mm. to our own goals. Sometimes we need people to go, uh, 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 right? But also... What we can then do, I think the second thing is when you probe, so Mike, how are you doing with the merch? And I'd be like, oh, well, I'm a bit stuck on this thing. Then you ask the really powerful question, how can I help, right? Mm-hmm. What can I do to, to support you? Maybe if you just talk it through, that will, that will actually really help you. So this idea is that there's, there's accountability and there's support when you actually know each other's goals. If you don't know them, Maybe what you could have done, I'm working away on the merch and say, hey, Mike, we've got a really urgent thing with the app and you might tempt me. But if you know I'm working on the merchandise, so you might, you know what, I'll tell him tomorrow mm-hmm. and let him get the merchandise finished. That's where you really start uh, having empathy for each other and not just like, well, I don't care. This is, a, this is a priority for me. If you understand what your colleague is trying to get done, what your direct report is trying to get done, then you can let them have the time and space to achieve their goals, support them, help them be accountable, help them talk it through. And I mean, that's why it's so simple. Talking about goals a lot and regularly is at the very heart of an effective, productive manager. Isn't that right? It's just about getting on that same page, getting the goals and feeling supported. And sometimes we can get a little lazy, can't we? Can we like, oh, I don't really want to talk about that stuff, right? Oh, yeah. it's always, but you know, it's, it's like waking up in the morning and having a cold shower. You do it every day. You wake yourself up. It's good hygiene for productivity. It's like, what are your goals? How can I help you today? And just being on the same page. It's so simple, Matt, but we kind of let it go, huh? Why yeah. do you think it is that we... We can't just keep up that that discipline. Why do we let go of that? Is it? Do you think it's sometimes it's a bit awkward, or or do you think we get a little selfish? I don't want to talk about them today. Well, Let's well, talk yeah. about me. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it could be that for sure. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's. I, I I think the word fear might be too strong, mm-hmm. but I think the word uncomfort. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I think if you are setting a goal with a colleague 
um, whether it's with your, let's say it's, it's with a manager. So I'm setting my goal for the week with my manager. Mm. Maybe I've started mm. a new job. Maybe it's a new quarter. There's a time when we're reviewing, or maybe it's just a standard week. Mm. And I know that there's something that's been hanging over my head or mm. there's something on the pipeline down the roadmap that I just am a, a bit, let's say afraid of. It makes me a bit mm. uncomfortable to then have to discuss that being a goal and maybe how I'm going to get there. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm going to want to try and avoid it yes. you know, from lack of responsibility perhaps, but more just because it's a bit of a drag. It's a bit of a, it it's out. a bad vibe, right? Like it's a bad um, vibe. I got this and thing and I'm not in good shape. Ugh, exactly. Right? Maybe there's uh, almost a level of embarrassment, maybe, yeah. uh, or Maybe it's just because you've been so distracted with your other items, your other goals, that you haven't had time to give it the proper due diligence and the proper work. Yes. So actually yeah. you don't have a, you don't have an update at all. And, yeah. and that's when it becomes uh, clear that you haven't prioritized things correctly. I know. It's really fascinating study of human behavior, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is. And it's very in line with what we were trying to um, uncover with David Allen's Mm. the getting things done, the art of stress-free productivity. Again, it doesn't have to be stressful, all of this, as long as you take ownership and you start being honest with yourself with regards to time blocking, maybe prioritization, yep. Yep. as well as setting the goals. I mean, yep. talk about productivity being a huge topic, Mike. <laughs> oh, listen, it keeps on giving. And if you're really interested in what we're discussing this show and you haven't heard the Dave Allen show or any of the others from this series or other productivity shows we've covered, you can head to a destination, can't you, Mike? There is a place to answer the call. My goodness, there's a place online that features uh, breakdowns with transcriptions, with models, with frameworks, with links to all of our clips that we show in the show, as well as our back catalog of 184 shows. And Mike, that is a little destination I like to call moonshots.io. Listeners, you can get access to our newsletter, you can access to the Moonshots model, and you can also click on the banner right at the very top and become a Moonshots member. Maybe you'll get your name called out next week. Yeah. Do you know, I got a funny message on um, Squarespace uh, this week, which is you have so many pages on your website because we've done so many shows. Squarespace had this little message. Are you sure you need all of these pages? You might want to go and archive some of these because <laughs> this is a rather big website. <laughs> That's funny. How funny is that, that we have so, we have done so many shows. We have studied so many amazing superstars, authors, and experts to learn how they do it, that even Squarespace is struggling to keep up with us. Come on, Squarespace, you can do this. So um, look, Mark, moonshots.io, hopefully this is everything you need. If you want to be the best version of yourself, go there check out uh, some of the previous shows in this series or any of the others. We have lots of links, you name it. We have a whole directory of all the models that we've discovered. You can access the master series. You can even become a member. How good is that? But I think, you know, when we talk about a destination to help you be the best version of the, yourself, you're going to find a lot of inspiration at moonshots.io. So it is only appropriate that if we're talking about being a manager, that we go find some inspiration. Where can we see the one minute manager actually happening in real life? And, you know, we could have gone and got a boring old office situation where the manager saying, what's your goal? How you doing? And all of that sort of stuff. But, you know, what we've done today is we've gone out and found somebody who I think is pretty much being the best version of themselves and they, they need feedback too. And they're getting feedback from somebody else who's rather amazing. That's right. We are going to play a clip in a moment that is the one minute manager actually being played out in real life between one of the greatest basketball coaches ever, Steve Kerr, and one of the greatest players ever, Steph Curry from the Golden State Warriors. So you can have a listen to just a, a quick few samples 
of Steve Kerr giving feedback to the MVP, the greatest all-time three-point shooter on the planet, Mr. Steph Curry. I would love to feel whatever the hell you're feeling right now, just once in my life. For me, like, if I went like five for six and made four threes, that was about the best I ever did. Here's what I'm going to show you. That's your shooting totals. That's your plus minus. All right? So it's not always tied together. You're doing great stuff out there. The tempo is so different when you're out there. Everything you generate for us is so positive. It shows up here. Not always there, but it always shows up here. You're doing great. Carry on, my son. Everything you generate is positive for us. Mm. Mark, even Steph Curry. In his prime, the greatest three-point shooter in the NBA's history, he still needs the coach to say, you're doing great. Isn't that important? What what, what a reminder that no matter where you are, whether you're in an office, you're working from home, you're on the court, you're an NBA superstar, uh, we all do need that little bit of reinforcement. You know, maybe it's um, that a bit of a confidence boost. Maybe sometimes it's to drag you back and, and focus you. But more often than not, the most powerful thing to get you focused, get you motivated, is that little bit of positive reinforcement. And what you're uh-huh. hearing from there, uh, from the manager, Steve Kerr, is that positive reinforcement, isn't it? You're doing great. You, we're reviewing your totals. It's, it's really interesting to take a moment to think about managers in different industries and how relatable and um, almost cross-industry uh, uh, these tips from Ken Blanchard can be, isn't it? One minute manager yeah. can be applied to any managerial situation. And I think importantly, if we're a little reluctant to give this kind of feedback, Hopefully what you can see there, if Steph Curry needs that feedback, somebody who is performing at a high level, I mean, they they play an enormous amount of games. Do you realize this season he will play close to 100 games? That's how many games are in the Golden State Warriors series uh, season this year because they're, gonna, uh, they're in the finals against Boston. Um, and he has to be great every single time. So what does his coach need to do? Praise him. So if you're feeling a little reluctant to give praise, remember this. If Tell you what, if Steph Curry needs praise, <laughs> we all need a little bit of praise, right? So don't hold back, right? So, Mark, why don't we now hear from Productivity Game and break down the art of one-minute praising? Having a game makes work more enjoyable but only if you can play the game. If a direct report lacks the skills required to do a task, it doesn't matter how clear the goal is, they're going to be disengaged. This is where the second secret of the new One Minute Manager comes in. One Minute Praisings. Suppose one of your direct reports needs to use a new software program to complete a task. You give her a self-guided tutorial and tell her to come to you if she has any questions. She doesn't return, so you assume that she's learning rapidly. But later you learn that she was stuck and frustrated, but didn't want to come to you with a stupid question, so she kept spinning her wheels. This is what you should have done. Ask your direct report to share her screen. Then watch her figure out the new software. If you sense that she's nervous, say, don't worry, I'm only watching to catch you doing something right. When you see her starting to understand a new command, turn up the emotion and say something like, nice, you figured out how to use command XYZ. This is going to help you and then explain a few things she'll be able to do as a result of learning this command. Then pause and give her a chance to feel some pride. Then encourage her to keep learning and try another command. At this point, you've completed a one-minute praising. First, you've specified what they did right and why it's important. Second, you've paused to let them feel good about it. As detailed in the book Tiny Habits by B.J. Fogg, letting a feeling of pride wash over someone rapidly wires in a new behavior. And then third, encourage them to keep learning. These one-minute praisings should be handed out early and often in a learning phase for any approximate success. Think of it like encouraging a child to walk. Initially, you praise them for standing up and taking a wobbly first step and then falling. 
You don't hold your praise until the child can sprint across the room like Usain Bolt. No, you praise anything that looks like progress. Praising early and often is the best way to accelerate learning and the fastest way to increase the confidence of your people. At the start of any new task, it's okay to watch your direct reports like a hawk as long as you're there to deliver one-minute praisings. Then you must slowly back off the praisings and encourage your people to praise themselves each time they use what they've learned. I think, Mike, that's a really nice breakdown of this concept of the one-minute praising. Mm. Um, particularly, I quite enjoy the, the reference to you wouldn't necessarily praise a child once he's reached the speed of Usain Bolt. <laughs> yes. you, you praise in the run-up to that that point. And I think yeah. that's an unfair assumption that we, we possibly, a lot of us have, which is you only should hand out praise when somebody does the miraculous, when you've reached the pinnacle of success. Above and beyond, right? Exactly. When you've gone beyond, maybe you've, you've, hit, you've landed on the moon, this is when I'll hand out some praise. But actually, as we're hearing from, from Ken Blanchard via Predictivity Game, if you hand out um, and positively reinforce these people through one minute praise every so often, you're going to build up that um, runway towards a uh, liftoff, let's call it, much, much quicker. And also you're going to make the team, that individual, a lot happier as well. Mm-hmm. And therefore they're going to benefit from feeling more confident and comfortable with any work that you give them. So that, pr- I mean, I think we're really learning and getting the sense of uh, the argument behind praise, aren't we? We are. And I love that little build he does is that at when they've really got it, that's when you kind of taper mm. it off a bit and then you encourage self-praise, which surely is just so fantastic that they can feel that inner confidence that they have not only mastered this activity, but when you know you can do one, maybe you, you know you can take a shot at doing a second or a third or a fourth skill that you can develop mm-hmm. and grow. And I, I just like, you know, it all started with praise early and often, right? That is such good advice, isn't it? Praise early and often because actually I think if you uh, then rewind or you take a step back, it's more likely that that individual will get themselves into a position that they A, feel comfortable with and maybe B, Mm. they could even become a manager themselves one day because you've given them enough confidence and autonomy to learn from the situation. Well, what you're getting into there is like, oh, well, then now we've got a scalable thing because maybe a CEO founder they build managers around them that can go on to manage on their behalf. And then, Hey, the business can grow because we're not people depend, you know, not people dependent in so much as, Oh, it's all about the one founder. No, the founder has inspired, grown support and nurtured others who are nurturing their own people. And Mm -hmm. Hey, we really got a thing going at that point, don't we? Yeah, that's right. And I, I feel as though that's one, uh, step on, isn't it? If you can convince somebody to feel confident with the work that they're delivering today, they're going to be more confident to deliver it tomorrow and in the years to come. That's right. That's right. But Mark, it's not only about the praise, is it? No. Sometimes there are going to be moments when you feel the need to give a little bit of maybe criticism, or maybe it's just a little bit of casual feedback in order to realign where somebody's going. So the third part of Ken Blanchard's The One Minute Manager is all about redirection. So now let's hear from Productivity Game again, breaking down Ken Blanchard's uh, advice on how to give a one minute redirect. Once you know a direct report knows how to do their job and hit their goal, but get lazy and miss their goal, it's time for a one minute redirect. The third secret of the new One Minute Manager. The authors in the book use the following sports analogy to illustrate the one minute redirect. It's the championship game and a star basketball player is playing terribly. Unless he picks up his game, his team will lose. So the coach takes him off the court and tells the star player exactly what he's doing wrong. You're missing easy shots. You're not grabbing any rebounds and you're loafing on defense. I'm angry at you because you don't look like you're even trying. Then the coach pauses for a long moment and says, you're better than that. You need to sit on the bench until you're ready to play the way you're capable of playing. After what seemed like forever, the player stood up, went to the coach, and said, I'm ready to go in, coach. Okay, get back in there and show me what you can do, the coach said. When the player went back in, 
He was all over the court, diving for loose balls, grabbing rebounds, and making his usual shots. Thanks to his effort, the team improved their play, and they won the game. In that short story, the coach delivered a one-minute redirect by first telling the player exactly what he was doing wrong, then telling the player how he felt about it, and then letting that disappointment and that emotional pain sink in, but then reminding the player he was better than his mistake. This one-minute redirect sounds simple, but most managers fail to do it correctly. Most managers fail to catch mistakes quickly and point out exactly what someone's doing wrong. In many organizations, managers wait till the annual performance review to tell a direct report what they've done wrong and why they're getting a low rating. And some managers give critical feedback without personal reassurance. By failing to remind someone that they're better than their mistake, they leave that person feeling worthless and unmotivated. As a manager, you must always find a way to say, you screwed up, but you're not a screw up. Or you did something bad, but you're better than that. Look, I, I, I listened to that. I was so captivated. It just had me thinking of the real power was not that, hey, you're doing something wrong, but it was, I know that you're better than that. Mm. Mm. And I think, um, I think a lot of feedback that we get in the office is just like, hey, Mark, hey, Mike, you made a mistake. That's wrong. Mm. Uh, you stuffed up. But actually, that's not really that helpful if you don't follow that up with, and I know you can do so much better. Mm. And then I think there's a build on that, which is, would you like some help with that? Yeah, I think that's an important build, isn't it? I think it, it really speaks to the respect between two individuals. Yeah. In this case, the manager and, and, the, and the teammate. And without that reassurance, as well as transparency, you know, you've got to have the honesty, you've got to have the ability to be comfortable to A, give some feedback, as well as B, receive some feedback. And when you've got that respect in that situation, in that relationship, what I think happens is both parties feel more confident. The manager feels as though the employee, okay, they've listened, that maybe they, uh, I've made sure uh, that they haven't taken it personally, that they know that they're better than that. So they're now inspired to go out and work maybe that little bit more, or maybe it's focus, maybe it's preparation, maybe it's confidence, whatever it might be. Likewise with the employee, because they are in that relationship that feels comfortable, feels reassuring, they are therefore going to maybe raise a hand next time that they get stuck again because they know that they won't be disciplined. Or it might be that they work maybe a little bit harder if that's the, the issue that they needed to um, address. I think it really comes down to this relationship, again, going back to Ken's uh, opening clip that we had, serving the individual first by uh, gently leading. You know, this idea of being there for the uh, teammate, encouraging them a little bit, being respectful, understanding where they're coming from and knowing that they're human beings, essentially, they can then come back onto the same page a lot smoother and it feels, yes. feels nicer. And I think if, if you are sharing in their goals, praising them when they do right, when you do call them out, I think you really get their attention because they're like, oh, this is the person that encourages me and listens to me. So like, I know this is not coming from just a judgmental or mm. a negative point of view, but most importantly, it's always this point that we made earlier. It's like, Hey, you did it wrong or you're not performing. And I know you can. Mm. Like, I think that is what really gets you like, Oh, they're right, you know, and I think this is at the heart of what Ken said at the beginning of the show, serving that person as their manager, not being the boss man, but being the servant leader, unlocking the potential within that person through understanding the goal and really giving praise and redirects when required. And it can be done quickly. It can be done daily. And that's how you stay on the same page. I mean, this is a really 
practical framework. It's so damn simple, but actually you don't see a lot of it. Like I want you to think about all of your career and how often do you see managers actively giving daily feedback on the goal, the praise, the redirect when required, like sometimes it's weekly, sometimes it's monthly, you know, it's like, just make it small, make it, you know Mm. what, Mark, it's a daily habit. Like so much of what we talk about on Moonshot, it's a daily habit, isn't it? Yeah. Rather than waiting for that performance review that comes around once a year that everybody sort of dreads, it's too late. You can't remember the situation. Uh, Maybe the, you now feel a little bit of animosity towards your manager because they didn't step in when you needed them to. They didn't identify when you were struggling. Instead, if you have that relationship that is a daily or weekly check-ins, goal setting, uh, receiving that praise or those redirects along the way, suddenly by the time that you come around to doing those annual check-ins, let's say, I mean, mm. think about the growth that you would have gone through over that year process by having yes. your weekly improvements. It's that 1% better every day from, from James Clear, isn't it? You work yeah. on something, daily habits. It comes through and little by little, um, they, they add up. I think the same is true with, with experience and work. It is. And, you know, um, this is uh, not only highly related to the work of James Clear and Atomic Habits, but like I would say, you know, you know Leaders Eat Last by Simon Sinek, another great mm. Uh, body of work, which we did a show on. So head over to moonshots.io if you want to check that out. But he also talked about servant leadership. So it's so powerful to see that this Moonshots model of the success habits, what great people do to realize their potential, to be the best version of themselves. There is an intersection between what we're studying today, Ken Blanchard, and the works of James Clear, of Simon Sinek, and many, many others. But I'll tell you there's another habit, Mark, that people can get into, and that is rating and reviewing our wonderful little Moonshots podcast, don't you think? That's right. Listeners, members, you can pop along into your podcast app of choice, whether it's Spotify or Apple Podcasts or any of the others that are available, and you can leave us a rating or a review. And this makes a big difference, Mike. This helps us get the moonshots message and the idea of learning out loud into the hands and the ears of listeners around the world. And we really do have a great spread of people coming from all four corners of the globe. And that's thanks to you, our dear listeners, your ratings, your reviews that you can do as you pop along, as you're walking and you're listening to us and you're thinking, okay, well, why don't I just open up Spotify or Apple Podcasts, leave a quick rating review. It's as simple as that. And it gets those algorithms working in the background and it gets the show out there into the four corners of the globe every single day. And Mike, I mean, it's great to see so many listeners joining us, isn't it? Oh, listen, we are, we are all over this, uh, great planet of ours. I mean, I'm, I'm just looking at the list here. So as you're listening, jump into your podcast app, give us a rating, give us a review. Come on. You're part of the team here. We need your help. We've got, you know, I'm just give you an example. I'm looking at the list here. We've got listeners in Namibia, Uganda, Hungary, Colombia, Belgium, Denmark, Ireland, Italy, Great Britain, Australia. Uh, the list is is ginormous, over 55,000 mm. listeners every single month from all over the world, hoping to be a better version of themselves, helping to, hoping to really learn out loud together. And we have one more clip that is going to be a source of inspiration, a source of helping us Uh, make the shift, the daily shift, the habit shift. So let's have a listen one more time to Mr. Ken Blanchard, the author of The One Minute Manager, and he's going to bring it all home now. All of these goals and praisings and redirects come down to this fundamental idea, our belief systems. How many of you know that the computer and the mind have a lot in common? Have you ever thought about that? Both your computer and your mind don't know the difference between the truth and what you tell it. You put information in a computer, it doesn't say, where'd you get these facts? These facts are wrong. 
What does the computer do? It does whatever it can with what? The information you've given it. What have we said about the computer for years? Garbage in what? Garbage out. Do you know it's the same way with your mind? If you woke up this morning and looked in the mirror and said, you are fabulous, your mind's not going to say, who are you kidding? (laughs) You know, I know you're a lot better than this. And uh, so what we put in our mind is so important. And one of the things, you know, people uh, ask me, you know, what, what business are you really in? I think, you know, it's really changing the way people think about leading and motivating people. I mean, that's really been my mission uh, for a long time. And so today is really about belief systems. And it's so interesting. Most of you already know the stuff we're going to talk about. Uh, I remember when the woman and manager came out, so many people came up and said, I could have written that, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because uh, it's not that all that complicated, uh, but it's it's all about about beliefs, you know, what what do you believe about people? And so that's what one of the things that we're going to really do uh, today is just kind of take on some beliefs you have, because unfortunately, there's a lot of stinking thinking about leadership. I mean, how many of you know that the major problem in the world today is leadership? I mean, have we seen what self-serving leaders have done in every sector of society and in countries and all that kind of thing as we look around the the world. It's just incredible, you know. I mean, Mike, this is again Ken Blanchard making the case for us today that managerial styles, getting the most out of your team and your those colleagues around you is by having that uh, belief system, that mindset approach, that focus on thinking about others that are around you in order to get the best, uh, let's say, value or the best work out of them. It's all down to having a good relationship with these people and communicating to them efficiently, isn't it? It's about the humility of putting your needs aside for a moment and serving others. And the great twist, Marky Mark here, is that in putting the others first, you end up creating all sorts of good things for yourself. So it starts with help others and you know what? They'll do good in their work. Maybe they'll help you. You'll Mm. have a culture of high performers rather than stragglers. This is all in front of you if you choose to put their development in front of your own needs. And so to me, it's just so tempting. Like as, as Ken said in that last clip, you know, the bright lights and the fame and the, and the, and the, and the ego can take over here. I think what Ken is saying, put your ego in a box, serve others, really understand their goals, give them praise, give them the redirects and good things are going to happen. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's all about, like you say, humility, as well as the understanding that, yeah, Others can help you too. Maybe there's something that you will learn by uh, being that little bit more productive with the teammates. Maybe you'll pick up something as well. I mean, that's a pretty good proposition, isn't it, Mike? And it all only takes one minute. Well, yes. If 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 only uh, more managers had the capacity to stick with it every mm. single day. But it's like life, you know, habits are hard to keep, you know, it takes discipline and structure and commitment. And you could say that's not only, you know, relevant to productivity, but I would say that's kind of the whole moonshots thing, isn't it? Mark? Yes, <laughs> it is. That's right? exactly it. <laughs> oh my gosh. So listen, Mark, we have covered a, a massive universe of the one minute manager. Uh, I'm, I'm dead keen to, to see, um, uh, Is it the big inspirational ideas or some of that really practical advice? What's really stuck with you over the course of the show? It feels very interconnected, this one. I think Mm. that there's a great structure from the goal setting through to the the praise or the redirects. But I think for me, Mike, it's the call out that we heard at the very beginning from Ken with regards to servant leadership and how it just starts with serving that individual. Because I think if if you haven't, quite got that right with the respect, with the knowledge that the other person is a human being, then 
your goal setting, your praising and redirects aren't quite going to come off quite as effectively. So for me, it's all about remembering if you're in a managerial position to help those around you first prior to uh, trying to lead and, and bark orders. What yeah. about you? What was what was uh, the, the big um, message or, or learning from you today? I, I tell you what I've walked away with is to drill down a bit more on the goals. Like what is the one goal that's the game changer here? Mm. I think I'm always fighting to, to define what that is for myself. So if I help others to do that, I just see everybody dealing with so many competing, uh, priorities. Mm. Like if I can help, uh, others focus on the one that really matters, the one that's going to get, you know, the, the outsized results, that's going to really help them. So, um, that's what I'm going to focus on. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. What, what, what a lot of, uh, action packed tips from Ken Blanchard. Oh, an absolute cracker today. And uh, Mark, I just want to say thank you for joining me on this uh, mission, not only of being a one minute manager, but I think uh, unlocking a little bit of uh, servant leadership. Pretty good, right? Yeah, pretty darn good. Well, thank you. And thank you to you, our listeners and our members. Once again, you have joined us on a journey of discovery, a journey into being the very best version of ourselves. And today in our productivity series, show 184, we studied the work of Ken Blanchard, the one minute manager. And boy, did he come in with both big ideas and practical steps. He said, this is all about productivity and so much more. And the so much much more is servant leadership and servant leadership starts putting others before yourself understanding their goals in one minute and we heard that you know it takes a bit of praising and some redirects and we even got to hear Steph Curry the greatest all-time NBA three-point shooter getting feedback from Steve Kerr so if he needs it we need it and I'm sure he gets some redirects as well and this is your choice as a manager how do you want to treat the people around you what are your beliefs what are your values if you get tuned into humility and to serving others you will be well on the way to being the best version of yourself and you can do that all together with Mark and myself here on the Moonshots podcast where we learn out loud together. That's a wrap.